Extra Minutes. John, what do you hope to find? I hope to find a tomb with a king. But I hope to find it at the centre of a whole network of the things that made it, so I can understand the community and the people that went into making it. It's not just a pile of gold, you know, it's not just a galloping along on a horse, falling, oh, there's the gold, that's great. I want to find more than that. I want to find the whole blooming thing. This tomb is at the end, really, without being too vague about it, it's at the end of ancient Egypt. This is the end of the great empire of Egypt with all the famous kings. And they're stuffing stuff in mountains and putting it all over the place. And we don't really understand the story. And this is the last chance we have to get in that tomb, one of the last kings of the new kingdom, and in that body of people that surrounded the king. Just wonderful. So you're hoping to find a tomb, but in doing so, you're hoping to find a story. The community, yeah, the story. The story of the ending of the new kingdom. Because what happens in Egypt, you've got two or three periods where they're building really, really big monuments like pyramids and you know, temples and all this stuff. And then it stops. It doesn't mean that, you know, they all got the plague or something. It means they didn't have any money to build or the king moved somewhere else. In this case, the king moved north and left Thebes behind. So the, this period of changeover was the last really authentic period of Egyptian building, modern, what we think of as ancient Egypt. What's the end of that? And we've got the guys' names who were in charge of doing all that stuff. So that's the really interesting thing. It's a remarkable piece of history. It's unique in the ancient world that we actually know the names of people in a small community who lived for hundreds of hundreds of years. So we're not only winding up the kings, we're winding up the community of their artists as well. What do you actually hope to find in the tomb itself? I would expect to find at least the name of the man who's in the valley, all around the cliffs. That's Herihor. But there's also a couple of his successors as high priest, king high priest type people. Their mummies are missing, and all the queens are missing. Now, first we might think, yeah, well, of course they're missing. It's been a long time ago, and they've all gone down to dust. But we've got all the others, you see. All the other kings are known. They're all now in the Cairo Museum. They've been found a hundred and more years ago. There's a few oddies that are missing. That's why it's the end of the puzzle. It's putting it all together. So I would hope that there will be Harry Hoare, a couple of his successors, and some of Egypt's greatest queens, Nefertari, people like that. Very famous. And what would be buried with them? Well, they'd all be in coffins, and I would expect them to have been worked over by the workmen who reburied them. But given that Howard Carter found these lumps off a granite sarcophagus up there, and these lumps are very particular, these lumps are lumps for handling the sarcophagus. So once it's in position in the tomb, they're cut off. And he found four of those up there, so there should be a granite sarcophagus up there, and that would be weird. One of the nice things about Egypt is you never quite know what's going to come out. I mean, there's always a, you're not dealing with a formula, you know, you're not dealing with a, a vocabulary like a grammar or something. A lot of Egyptologists attack ancient Egypt like it was a motor car engine. It's got this bit, that bit, the other bit, all we need to find is that bit, and it'll go again. It's not, you know, these are people who think, so sometimes they do something that's unexpected, like make a granite sarcophagus. <laughs> it's extraordinary. So who knows, who knows? It might be the most extraordinary tomb. It really could happen. It's so vulgar and so extraordinary that there's only people as stupid as me want to touch it, really, to <laughs> tell you the truth. See, Egyptologists are happy, you know, drawing their little hieroglyphs in tombs, and they, that's what they got their permission to do, and they don't want to do anything else. But this is out there, and it's really big, and there's other people going out there now, and I don't want the place damaged before we can actually record it properly. Yes. That's really important. Can you imagine the world's reaction if you open up that tomb and there are riches beyond Tutankhamun? Magic. Think what it would do for each Egyptian tourist industry at the moment. We're to, you know, in Tutankhamun's tomb there are 20 or 30 boxes, beautiful boxes, some of them highly decorated, some of them plain. Some of them had joints of meat, others were full of ju gold and jewellery. So it's a box a week, folks, you know, tune in on Saturday evening at 8.30 and we're going to open another box. There's nothing to stop you doing things scientifically and properly, but this is such a world event. It's like Tutankhamun's tomb went round the world. Tut's tomb was an enormous phenomenon, and it's right that it is. It's a piece of human history, and it's theatre when you open it. 
So it's very right that there should be movie cameras and things there, and not just a bunch of guys puffing on pipes, not letting anybody in, actually. Feel strongly about that. That's right. Make it accessible to the people. Yes, the, the, the wonderful things that the human race was making 3,000 years ago. Yeah.